I want you to picture a party, a room packed with people throwing themselves into the bass boosted music that rattles the floor. There's a certain feeling of weightlessness as all their problems dissipate under the blinding fluorescent lights. Their exultant expressions say that in that moment, they're the happiest they could possibly be. But alas, in a corner of the room, tense and ill at ease, is someone wishing they were anywhere but there. That was me, hi. I understand that my distress might seem a little unreasonable, considering I had no apparent reason to feel that way. The problem was, I could hardly find a way to connect with the people around me. Context. This unfortunate incident occurred shortly after my family relocated to India from the Middle East. The music blaring through the speakers was in Hindi, songs that I'd heard numerous times before, and I'd made the effort to dress up in a langa in hopes of blending in with my new peers. Unfortunately, I still stuck out like a sore thumb. With my Spotify playlist being dominated by the likes of Ed Sheeran, Taylor Swift, and Five Seconds of Summer, all English artists, I didn't know the songs well enough to sing along. Neither was I familiar with the Bollywood choreography for them, which somehow everyone around me seemed to have mastered. After awkwardly swinging along for a while, I spent the rest of the evening sitting alone, finally succumbing to the overwhelming feeling of exclusion. I'm what you might call a third culture kid. Sociologist Ruth Yassim coined the term for children who spend their formative years in places that are not their parents' homeland. For me, that was the United Arab Emirates, where I was born and lived for 16 years. While I might not have lived in five different continents, with the UAE being home to a staggering nine million expatriates from over 200 different nationalities, it sometimes feels like I have. The thing about coexisting alongside so many different nationalities is that while you're bound to bring parts of your own culture to your interactions with them, you have to learn to express yourself in a way that is not overpowering, so as to be well received. This makes it impossible for any one culture to take prevalence. And so, in a country like the UAE, something of a hybrid culture is birthed instead. I grew up in a household that spoke English and had friends who spoke Arabic and French and everything in between. I learned vocabulary from different languages and picked up cultural habits from the people around me as I grew to imbibe the spirit of global-mindedness. But being raised with the UAE's focus on multiculturalism, I just didn't have the kind of authentic Indian experience that would have allowed me to speak Hindi fluently or develop an interest in Bollywood, for example. Like wearing traditional Indian clothing, these were more accessories, reserved for one-off themed parties or cultural days. So, when I was uprooted and moved to India last year, I was in for a rude awakening. Suddenly, what I saw as being sporadic and peripheral was integral to the people around me who had grown up immersed in the culture. Apart from the fact that we had the same nationality and kind of the same accent, I had so little in common with my new peers. It made me feel unsettled and lonely, like I was a fake Indian with no real sense of identity or belonging. I've always had a rocky relationship with my heritage. Now, to be clear, my Indian roots were never something I tried to stuff in a box, bury underground and forget about. In fact, it was near impossible for me to do that the UAE is home to three and a half million other Indians, which meant I was surrounded by people who were very similar to me. Even at home, although my parents never conversed in Hindi with me, mealtimes were largely traditional, reflecting their South Indian tastes. There was an abundance of factors anchoring me to my Indian origin, but at the end of the day, I wasn't in India. I was in a completely different country with different norms that define my upbringing and sense of identity. Given that there are aspects of Indian culture that I genuinely appreciate and that are central to the person I am, it never felt right for me to disregard it, but it never felt right for me to completely accept it either. With most of my experiences involving India taking place once a year during family vacations, 
I simply haven't had enough opportunities to develop strong emotional connections to the country. When I think of home, I think of Dubai. It was where I had so many of my first times, like the first time I cut myself a hideous set of bangs, hideous. And the first time I tried to woo a guy who clearly had no interest in me. I felt so out of touch with my homeland. Trying to fully imbibe Indian culture felt unnatural and forced because it felt like I was trying to be somebody I just wasn't. My friends in India jokingly called me a coconut, a jab at the contrast between my brown exterior and my not-so-brown disposition. The subtle condemnation from people only made me feel more guilty for not living up to this paradigm of the ideal Indian citizen. I just couldn't understand. Why? Why did I have to feel so strongly about a place I had no attachment to just to appease the expectations of all these people? But that's when I had a breakthrough. It's easy to forget that culture is only one small aspect of identity and not identity in itself. Being born into a society with distinctive cultural norms can certainly lay the foundation for an individual's personality and habits. The collectivism that dictates social dynamics in the global south has instilled in me a deep appreciation for my family. However, my behavior as a whole is under the influence of far more than just the culture I was born into. It's been shaped by the people I've met, the cuisines I've indulged in, the music and television I've enjoyed. In some ways, having an indeterminate cultural framework is liberating because it allows me to define myself by my interests and passions instead of having to fit a predetermined mold. Identity is less about geography, the color of your skin, or the passport that you own, and more about the experiences that you have. Intentionally or not, we change and shed parts of ourselves through our encounters with different people and ideas, meaning it is incredibly rare for a person's behavior to be dictated by a single cultural system. In fact, any influence that your default culture has on your identity is likely to be diluted at some point. The world is becoming increasingly globalized, meaning it is easier than ever to meet and interact with people and cultures from all over the world, especially with the internet and social media. Take anime and manga, for example. How did these Japanese art forms become so popular in India? It's because they're so easily available online. It's practically inevitable that we assimilate elements of different cultures into our own frameworks, particularly ones that complement our personal beliefs and interests. Think of it as an all-you-can-eat buffet. You look at all that the spread has to offer before piling the tastiest-looking items on your plate. Similarly, as you navigate the world and come face-to-face -face with different traditions and perspectives, you choose to retain the things that most strongly resonate with you. This can evolve as you grow as a person and expand your wealth of experiences. It just goes to show that a rigid sense of culture has very little meaning to our identity when we are constantly unlearning and relearning from the world around us. If something of a culture different to our own resonates with us, then there's no reason we should stop ourselves from embracing it. Is it so wrong to appreciate something if it adds meaning to our lives? Is it so wrong to recognize the most beautiful parts of each other and choose to honor them? Now, don't get me wrong. The point of this talk is not that your traditional culture is worthless and that you should go home tonight and pick another one to follow. Preserving cultural diversity is key to keeping our communities grounded, but not in a way that threatens the integrity of your own identity. My fellow third culture kids and anyone struggling with their cultural identity, I leave you with the final thought. We could always try to reconnect with our roots, but maybe feeling lost is actually an avenue to continue roaming, exploring all that the world has to offer. Sometimes, cultural authenticity is simply a construct, stopping us from being our most authentic selves. It's time we redefine authenticity to mean being who we truly are, even if that deviates from the norm, Perhaps we could let our roots anchor us to the ground while our flowers blossom into what makes us happy. This way, we might just find 
the truest version of ourselves without losing what makes us irreplaceable.